John the Baptist has been put to death. And we know that after John's death, that Jesus started withdrawing from the public eye. He started not being so out there, especially in the, the Jewish settlements, especially in the Jewish towns. He had, he had kind of started moving away from them for several reasons, and he was in the area of Capernaum, but now he starts moving into the occupied areas by the, of the Gentiles. His withdrawal, well, it's being prompted for several reasons. We've talked about how his disciples needed him more now than they had in the past because he knew that his death was soon in coming. And because of this, he wanted to spend time with them and preparing them because he knew what they had yet to receive and understand is that at the point of his death, his burial and resurrection, everything was going to change. The entire scheme, the entire plan of salvation being fulfilled through the Messiah was going to completely change how the world and especially how the Jews had perceived God. And so he needed to prepare them for that because this was going to be something that was going to be beyond their understanding, especially at this time. He also needed to get out of the crosshairs. Herod wasn't real pleased with what he was doing. Just putting John to death, he thought that Jesus was John the Baptist come back to life, which meant that he now was a target. We also know that the Pharisees and the religious leaders wanted to destroy him. If that wasn't bad enough, the people wanted to make them him their king. And so there was all of this political unrest, and Jesus, knowing that the time was not yet, decided that the best thing to do was just to pull back and to separate himself from the crowds. But even so, in doing, he, he didn't get separation from those that were seeking to undo him. The Jewish leaders seeking him out, trying to find opportunity to accuse him, to discredit him, are willing to travel to great lengths in order to confront him. Look at verse 1 of chapter 15. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying... The scribes and the Pharisees come from all the way in Jerusalem. Now, we know that Capernaum from Jerusalem, where Jesus' home base was, about 85 miles is, as the, the roads fly right now, as you can drive there. It takes about an hour and a half, two hours to get from Jerusalem to that area up there of the, the galley. So you can imagine back then, it took considerable days for them to be able to navigate, to travel by either horse or by donkey or however Pharisees traveled at that point in time to get there. So they were willing to put a huge investment in going after that which they didn't agree with. And it's very interesting because even now we see that there is extreme effort that goes into and on the part of those who oppose the things of the Lord. I mean, I, I still don't understand how it is that somebody that doesn't believe in God has got such a problem with those that do. How it is that if you have no belief in it, how you would be so afraid that someone would be influenced by the things of the Lord. You know, the, the Ten Commandments and, the, and, and, and school prayer, all of that was taken out for the fear that it might influence somebody. Taking away all options on their part to have a choice to choose but it removed that whole other side of what is reality in relationship to the lives of people in the public arena. And the problem is, is that it really truly comes to the point of saying that people must be too stupid to make up their own minds. The side that would oppose it, the side that would say all things about God needs to be removed, all of the signs, all of the crosses, all of the, all of the indications of Christianity need to be blotted off of the, the surface of the landscape and out of our hearts and out of our minds and away from public view because if you see it, you might want it. You see, that's the goal. You see, not saying that this is an option, as is this, you choose what's best for you. It's like, no, we need to remove that which is truth, in order that the only option that's left is that which is not. And so these guys were really ready and willing to do whatever they had to do to stop Jesus, including traveling. And back then, traveling wasn't like it is today. It was a little bit rougher. But they come to Jesus and they say, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. 
we live in a culture where bucking the social norms is considered to be an American privilege. I mean, it really is. For those that buck the norm, for those that don't hold to a standard, very often they're, they're seen as visionaries and free thinkers. And, oh, isn't this great that this person has, has chosen to go completely against that which is, well, used to be social norms. I don't think we have any social norms anymore. We have a norm in the sound room, but we don't have any social <laughs> norms. That was not in my notes. I mean, we've gotten so far away from standards, standards of behavior, standards of morality, right? Anything that would, would be agreeable in relationship even to the masses as we would go back 50, 75, 100 years. Rather, it had to do with a, with a, a religion or a Christian foundation. There were mores, there were values that people realized. It wasn't good to steal. It's not good to cheat. It's not, it's not right to, to do Many of the things that we find in the Ten Commandments were considered to be good regardless of their origination because they were good for mankind. And you know what, guys? We don't have those norms anymore. We don't have those, those social restraints anymore. And yet in this day and age, there was a high consideration for the rules that were in place. So this accusation about not washing hands while it had absolutely nothing to do with sanitation or cleanliness, you can see the Orthodox Jews were referring to a ceremonial washing of the hands. I mean, it was bad enough that Jesus' followers hang out, would hang out with, with those that were, well, outcasts and less desirables, but now these guys don't even seek to be ritually purified before the meal, before they eat. You ever wonder where we get the traditions that we have for praying before the meal? Right? Some of us grew up in houses to where you had to pray before you ate it. Because it might not have been good. Others have thought that somehow or another, yeah, you'll get that later, laugh like crazy. <laughs> Some of us grew up in a house knowing that it was, it, it was about protection. It was about being thankful for our daily bread. It was about thanking the Lord for our provisions and for those type of things. Well, the traditions that these guys are talking about and the things that these guys are going to are, are so ingrained within their culture that, that they really come down on the disciples and saying, these guys are failing to do that which is completely a part of who we are as Jews. The act of washing hands was done before each meal, and it was done in such a way that it was supposed to demonstrate cleanliness before God. And the ritual was such that water would be poured over, over the, the, the devout Jew's hands in such a way, and he would hold his hands in such a way that the water would run off at the wrist. It had to run off at the wrist. It couldn't run down the arm because if it ran down the arm, then that which was on the hands and that which defiled would now defile the arm, and now you'd have to wash more. So they had this whole practice of how they would, would rinse and wash their hands, making sure that the water ran off at the, at the wrist and nowhere else. And this was a big deal. It was something that they did before every meal. Traditions come in all shapes and sizes. How many of you in here have traditions in your family? Yeah. How did you get those, right? You get traditions through a process most of the time because, well, you did something and it worked, so you want to do it again. How many of you have traditions based on really, really bad outcomes? You see, we normally don't do that. I mean, I'm not like, well, I'm going to start a tradition. I'm going to celebrate when I broke my toe every year on this day by re-breaking my toe. No, you don't do that. If it had a bad outcome, we avoid it. We try not to incorporate it. But if it had a good outcome, if it was something even that just is a reoccurring type of event because of a calendar date or because of an anniversary or because of something of that nature, it's prime and it's ripe to become a tradition. And yet many of the traditions that we have, while some of them can have great meaning and great value, a lot of them are just silly and goofy, aren't they? I mean, a lot of the traditions or things that we do traditionally. I once heard about a family that all of their lives they had grown up understanding that they had to cook the ham for, for Christmas in two pans. Every year, their mom would take the ham 
and she would slice part of it off and she would put it in a smaller pan and put it in the oven. And then take the larger piece and put it in a larger pan and put it in the oven too. And so the girls in the family grew up, the kids grew up knowing that this was how you had to fix the ham. It was tradition. And so years and years later, they're trying to figure out and they're asking where this tradition started because they've been doing it now for three generations. Every year, they would pull out the ham, they'd slice off part of it, put it in a small pan and set it off to the side. And they ate it at the same time. It didn't seem like it was a special portion. And so finally, they got around and one of the grandchildren had the nerve to call grandma. Grandma, why do we do this? And she goes, do what? She says, the tradition of cutting a piece off the ham and cooking it in a smaller pan. She says, tradition? She says, I just did that because I didn't have a big enough pan. <laughs> but it was tradition. And so you have to do it because it's tradition. It's always good to ask, though, when it comes to a religious tradition, when something that is being promoted in the church, it's always good to ask, where do we find this in Scripture? Where is the example? Where was it established? Where was it practiced by the Lord? Or where was it practiced by the apostles? The traditions the Jewish leaders came up with on this came from what were known as the oral law. Of Moses, the oral traditions. These were instructions that the rabbis claimed were spoken to the elders and passed down to the nation from Moses. The oral law had had not for, for a very long time been encapsulated and written down, and so it was just that. It was the oral law. It was it was meant to be good. It was further instruction. Oh, the law says this, the written law says this, but this is the explanation. And then at one point in time or another, they went ahead and encapsulated encapsulated them in what is known as the Mishnah. The problem with the Mishnah, although it set out originally to add additional information, clarification, even examples of how to enforce or comply with the law, the problem was is that it became in time more important and more authoritative than Scripture itself. The leaders of the day held higher regard for these traditions than they even did for the Word of God. And what was more alarming is, is that many of the traditions that came through this oral process did so in such a way that they were in opposition to the things of God. That they actually opposed the intent and the purpose behind what God had established. It's sad, but the same thing happens today. The very same thing happens today. Over the years, traditions have been so established in certain churches and orthodoxy that doctrine of a tradition is held up to be the same standard as that as the Word of God. A practice or a person other than God is elevated to the place of deity or the means by which the church operates and exercises its authority as, it, as a, a, a shepherding aspect over those that are in it has gone to the place to where now they have put themselves between man and God as the authority. And that was never the intention of any of the things that God had put into place as it pertains to this. As these guys make this accusation, these religious leaders are forcing Jesus to deal with literally the very, very foundation of their faith. And he is going to let them know that they're of opposition to the Word, the very Word that he is. Many years ago, I had an opportunity. My, my family was visiting, and actually we were visiting Carson City. It's many years ago, before we moved here even though before we knew we were going to move here. And we were visiting, and we had an opportunity to go to a church with some friends of ours, and, and not really being familiar with the area, and being familiar with our friends, and it was, it, was, it was a good thing. We just said, well, we'll just go to your church. It was a Christian church. It was a denominational, mainstream denominational church. And, and we went in, and, and, and it was kind of a new and unique area. I had yet to have really been called into being a pastor at that point in time. I was kind of lay pastoring some of the the, the things over in the church in Ely where we were at, but I was not received the, the call to be, you know, completely in, in, in the place of a pastor. And I, I, I walked into this place and we looked around and I was 
first off, kind of kind of shocked by all of the pomp and circumstance. I mean, the place, the uh, you know, the, the decorations and the stained glass, because I don't go to churches like that. I don't have much stained glass around here. They were doing communion, which I understand that they do every Sunday. But it's only for people that are members of that church. And I, being the young, studious individual that I was, politely, and I did very politely, I asked if I could speak to one of the, the pastors or whatever. I don't remember exactly what they called them. And we had about a 20-minute discussion on why it was that someone who is a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ would be not allowed to participate in communion, in the fellowship of the Lord's table. And for about 20 minutes, he tried to explain to me that this was their tradition. It was their tradition to exclude those that were not members of that church, to, to only make it available to those who had gone through their process of indoctrination in relationship to what, what they believed about. And I, and, and I asked him very, very simply, and again, I was being very, very polite, and, and I asked him, I said, can you show me in Scripture where you find that practice? And he was done with me. So, <clears throat> now, I, I'll tell you something. After, after these years and after coming into the place where God has ultimately brought me, I realized to try to do that right before a church service was really not appropriate on my part. I mean, really, so so I, I, I really give that individual a lot of credit and a lot of, lot of, of, of grace in relationship to the grace that he extended to me in order to let me distract him so terribly right before the service that he was doing. But you'll notice that there's communion elements here on this table, right? We're going to, at the close of this service, we're going to go before the Lord's table. And there are some requirements. In order to be able to participate in this table, what the Scripture says, what the Bible says, is that you have to believe in Jesus Christ. And you have to believe in him for salvation, which means you have to believe that he died, he was buried, and he rose again. And you accept that by faith in order to receive salvation. And then the only other thing that we are encouraged and even commanded to do is we are supposed to Look at our own hearts. We're supposed to judge our own hearts before the Lord. And if there's anything that we have that we need to ask forgiveness of, we need to do that so that the communion that we would have, the common union that we would have through this table is not interrupted by something in our lives that would cause us to be separated from Christ. That's the only condition. So if you're here today, and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're willing to take and to reflect on your own life and to, and, and to ask the Lord for, anything, for forgiveness of anything in your life that you need to before you would take this table, you are free to, to join in. Because we don't have membership here. You can't be a member here if you wanted to. You can come here. If you, actually, if you come through the door three times, you're kind of a quasi-member. Okay? <laughs> But we don't have a role. We don't have a, a process. It's all about what the Word of God says. He answered them and he said, this is Jesus speaking back to the Pharisees, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? So the Lord replies to their accusation of violating tradition by pointing out how they were actually breaking the law of God by practice tradition. Now, this is not a this for that. This is a not trying to say, well, you do this and you do this. This isn't the Lord trying to draw that they too are doing something wrong. As a matter of fact, Jesus is taking them to a place that is much, much deeper by comparison. Jesus is declaring that their traditions in themselves are against the word and the law of God. Look at what it says in verse 5. But you say... Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have had received from me is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. The Hebrew word for gift is korban. If a Jew wanted to escape financial responsibility, he could declare that all of his possessions, all of his worth, all of his money and resources were Corban, were gifted to God. And what he would say is he would just simply come to the place of, 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 of telling others that he couldn't meet his obligations. He couldn't 
take care of mom and dad. Mom and dad, I can't take care of you because everything I own belongs to God. It's God's money. Sounded great. The problem was, it was a, the creation of a savings account for God that God didn't have the numbers to. God wasn't allowed to get into it. He didn't have access to it. And they would declare that everything that they owned was a gift to God, and thus it couldn't be used for any other purpose, but yet they were the ones that determined when and if God would ever need it. Now in this culture, and I believe as it should be, that the concept of honoring a mother and a father is one that extends the caring for them in their old age. And it extends to the place that large families were considered to be a blessing in those days because the chances of mom and pop or grandma and grandpa being taken care of because there was a lot of resource was a good thing. That's why I like the fact that I have so many kids. One of them's bound to take care of me when I start drooling. So in effect, what's happening here is Jesus says, you guys have come up with a tradition. This wasn't even something that you could say was an oral law or oral command. You've come up with a tradition that says, by virtue of declaring everything that you own to be a gift of God, you have protected your resources by virtue of greed. And you are violating the law of God concerning honoring and taking care of your parents. You see, Jesus backs up. He backs up beyond the oral traditions. He goes back beyond that. He goes back beyond the 613 rules and regulations that were in the written laws. And he goes all the way back to the fifth commandment. And he says, your tradition, all the way at the end of this process, is flawed, is skewed, is of no value, is, a, is ungodly, because it violates all the way back to the very beginning of God's command to honor your parents, to honor your father and mother. And so Jesus is undoing them at their own, at the very fiber of what they believe. He goes on in verse 7, he says, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and in vain they worship me. Listen, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus concludes his reply by qu quoting Isaiah. I love that. And he makes clear that obedience to traditions of men makes obedience to the Word of God impossible. In this sense, the Lord claims and voids all traditions that are not founded and grounded in the Word of God. Unfortunately, there are still many evangelical traditions today. Churches are full of them. They're man-made teachings that are often considered as authoritative as the Word of God. And even though they, at times, will contradict the Word of God, they continue on. By obeying these traditions, Chris, Christians rob themselves, literally, of the power of God's Word and the power of His Holy Spirit. Now, we can clearly see that there's a lot of damage that is done by the application of traditions as doctrine, but often the process is much more subtle. You see, it's one thing for us to look at mainstream denominations or other religious organizations and say, wow, they've got a lot of things that they have added to and, and, and or taken away from the Word of God in order to be able to facilitate their idea of how to do this. But you know where else this happens? It happens in our heads. I mean, there are times when we will start developing Christian traditions based on what works for us, what was good for us, what was a good experience, what was something that we would like to see happen again, something that, that, that took place that had the right focus initially, but now has created within it this set of standards, this set of priorities that I now have in my life, it's very easy for me to start establishing traditions and circumstances by which I would operate only in a particular fashion. I can come up with my own sets of rules and regulations. Now, that's not always a bad thing. 
as the Holy Spirit would work within us, as the Holy Spirit would convict us of sin, and we start looking at some of the things that we need to do in order for us to honor the Lord, in order for us to be able to take personally and develop a strong relationship with Jesus Christ, that's not a bad thing. But the problem is, is that we very seldom keep them to ourselves. I would much rather share with you the things that I'm trying to do and impose them on you in a way that you, you should than to just try to keep doing them on my own. I mean, if I don't do it because I'm spiritual, then you shouldn't do it in an effort to be spiritual too. Right? God bless you. I mean, that's tradition, by the way. <laughs> don't ever stop doing that. I love doing that because people freak out. They don't know what you're talking about in, in this day and age. You're in, in the Walmart. This is, a, this is a segue, by the way. You're in Walmart and somebody sneezes. I always say, God bless you. And some people are like, oh, that's a, that's a wonderful remembrance. And other people are like, why? And then you get to explain it. What was I talking about? Traditions. Traditions that we lock into or things that we impose, just as, just as the Pharisees had gone to Jesus and said, why aren't your guys doing what we do? Why aren't they doing it? It's tradition. It's the way that it's supposed to be. Now, there are certain things within the church that are doctrine, but understand, never confuse doctrine and tradition. Doctrine comes from God. Tradition comes from man. Trying to practice that which God has given. And so don't confuse them and don't make application to other people's life on something, even if it works for you. I have people all the time that will come to me and say, well, you know, well, how did you do this? Or how did you do that? And I'm willing to share. But I don't say, and you should too. I don't know how God's going to work in you. I don't know what his timing is for you. I don't know how it is that, that he's going to manifest his will through your life. It may be totally different than how he did it for me. I'll be glad to share you with what he did with this numbskull, but that doesn't mean that he's going to be able to work with you in the same way. You may be brighter than I am. Chances are you probably are. But then he called the multitude to himself, and he said to them, Hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man so he finishes with the pharisees and he turns to the people and he says come here guys i want i want you to listen i'm paraphrasing i want you to listen to this i want you to hear this it's not about what you eat or how you wash your hands it's not that from the outside which will defile you but it's that which comes out of your mouth that proceedeth from the heart that defiles a man now, th this was a very, very radical approach. Jesus says it's from the inside out, not the outside in, that matters. And this was totally opposed to what the Pharisees had promoted. The Pharisees said that if you didn't practice the law on the outside, if you didn't look good on the outside, then you couldn't be good on the inside. And as a matter of fact, the relative aspect of them determining how good you were was how well you practiced the law. You remember what Paul said? As a Pharisee, that he was what? As a lawyer, he was perfect in all of the law. He was perfect. He had all of the routines down. He had all of the outside manifestations of what it was supposed to look like if everything on the inside was in good shape. But the reality is, it's not about what's on the inside that defiles Jesus says, it's not what you eat. It's not if you clean your hands. It's about what's going on in your heart. Then his disciples came to him and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Thank you, Captain Obvious. I mean, really? Really? I mean, the disciples are so on top of it, all right? I don't think the Pharisees like what you said. You think? But he answers them and he says, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. Underline that. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of, bl of the blind. And if a blind leads the blind, both will fall in the ditch. The Lord uses a very direct rebuke to the religious leaders of his day. First, he says, they're not of my father. Wow, that's strong. 
that's strong. They're not of my Father. And if they're not, then they're going to perish. They're going to be uprooted. They're not going to stand. It's not going to remain. Then he says, let them alone. Let them alone. They're blind guides. And guys, we need to realize that there are a lot of blind guides out there. There's a lot of people out there that are just truly blinded to the the reality of what God's Word says. And it's why it's so important that we know what the Word of God says because some of these blind guides sound like they know where they're going. It sounds good. I mean, every two years, three years, there's a new guru that hits the, 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 the circuit in the commercial and in the the the, the the professional work world and they rehash and they re come up with some kind of program and all of a sudden they're the latest and greatest because they have insights that no one else had before except for they called it something else and the reality is is that they are blind guides but yet they get people lined up for miles following behind them only to wind up in a place that doesn't lead them to security and peace and salvation. And so it's important that we understand that that while we need to be aware that they are there, while we need to understand what God's Word said as the means by which we would combat their information against the truth, that which is false, which that which is not, it's not our place to go after them. Now, I'm glad that there are watchdog groups out there. I'm glad that there are groups out there that go after and, and, and tell us and warn us, and, 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 and there's good sources of information. But let me tell you what the greatest source of information is on who's godly and who's not. It's sitting in your lap. It's sitting in your lap. And it is powered by the Holy Spirit in the life of one who has received and accepted and embraced Jesus Christ in such a way that the Spirit is revealing truths to you that when somebody holds up a counterfeit, you're going to go, no, that's not right. That's not correct. It doesn't say that in the Word of God. And even though this sounds really good, at least, and, and, and it's coming from somebody that looks really good. See, the religious leaders looked good to the people. They looked like they knew what they were doing. They looked like they were, they were right on top. of These are the best guys, the smartest guys, the most spiritual guys in the room. They're such wonderful leaders. The problem is, is that if they alter the Word of God, if they devalue the Word of God, or if they get off base because they have another agenda that is more self-serving than it is honoring of God, then they're blinded. And they're not going to bring honor and glory to God by virtue of what they're doing, regardless of how good they look as they're doing it. Peter speaks up and says, Lord, explain to us this parable. You've got to love Peter. He was either the brightest guy in the room or the dumbest brick. I mean, because he goes back and forth from both to both. Lord, you are the Christ. Lord, what do you mean by that? So Jesus says, are you still, are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Jesus says it's not about what's on the outside. It's not about the outside presentation. Now, here's the thing. The reality is that after we would receive Jesus Christ, that we would accept him into our hearts, and the the Lord starts working within us, and things start happening from the inside out, does that help the outside appearance? Lord, I hope so. I hope that there is a change. I hope the first place that we recognize it and the first place that that change starts working has to do with our presentation to the world around us. I did a memorial service on um, Friday, and it was very uh, very interesting. I, I, I probably do three, sometimes four services a month, and sometimes they're folks that are known to me. Sometimes they're, they're not. I'm just available to the community as a need would arise, and so I... I, I, I really enjoy actually doing celebration and memorial services. I like it. 
Because people are willing to listen like sometimes never before in their lives at that particular moment just because of what's happened in their lives and the loss. But one of the things that, that, that was said about this person over and over and over and over again was how kind she was. How kind she was. How kindness was, was the, the very, very hallmark of her character and her, and her personality, right? And, and somebody during the process of, of sharing a, a, an instance, she said that one of the things that was so amazing about her kindness is that her face got the message that she was kind. And I thought, well, what, what, what does that mean? And I got to thinking about that, and I thought, well, sometimes we talk about we've got the joy of the Lord. Sometimes we, we've got this enthusiasm and this love in our lives, and we love the Lord, and we know He loves us, and we're, we're knowing that our destination is heaven and everything else. The problem is, is that we will tell ourselves this over and over again. We just forget to tell our face. There's a lot of frumpy Christians out there. I've been a Christian for 27 years. I love the Lord. (laughs) Tell your face. (laughs) It's not getting the message. I mean, what's the first thing that people see when they see you? They look into your face. And you you know how to do it. You know how if you don't want to engage them, how to do that. Right? You have to avoid eye contact at all costs, right? When I'm in the airplane and I don't want anybody to sit next to me, I just grab the air sickness bag and go, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. <laughs> we know how to avoid people. We know how to show people when we're not happy. We got that look, the dagger eye look. But what about the other side of it? What, 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 is, what is it that, that, that should be showing? What is it that should be coming out of, of our lives and of our hearts? This, this, this aspect of Christ being within us, us knowing what our destination is, us knowing that we've been forgiven of our sins, knowing that, that we have the light and the salt that would preserve and it would bring the, 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 the world into, in, into light out of the darkness. And yet we walk around sometimes, and, and I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I have a neutral face that looks somewhat like a frown. And my wife from time to time, you know, and, and I realized where I developed this, you know, is, 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 is I worked in penitentiaries for many, many years. And what I found was that you didn't want to be too happy there. It just didn't fit. You didn't want to give anything away. So you didn't, you didn't become overly demonstrative in that situation. You just kind of just stayed middle of the road. So that, and so every once in a while, my wife would look at me and she'd go, why are you frowning? And I go, I'm not frowning. She'd say, yes, you are. I said, no, honey, this is just the way my my face hangs. (laughs) But it is a conscious thing. And see, right now, I love it. I look at it, and you guys are smiling, and you're laughing, and and it goes all the way from your mouth to your eyes to your heart. And guys, that's the joy. That's what people should see when we talk about Jesus. That's what people should see when we talk about our collective experience and understanding that our sins have been forgiven, that there's hope for the future, that while everything around me may be collapsing and falling down, I have this wonderful hope and this joy that's in my heart that I can express in every part of my being. And one of the best places for that to take place happens at the first thing that people see. And so practice it. Some of you are going to struggle with this because some of us have worked really, really hard to get that frumpy face. So practice it. Smile. Look in the mirror and and think, Jesus. Get it down. Don't make it creepy. Don't make Don't make it creepy. The Lord says it's not about what goes inside. As a matter of fact, when it comes to food, we're just food processors. It goes in, it comes out. The food that goes in never really reaches the heart. Well, not in a spiritual sense, because <laughs> we can defile our bodies with a lot of things that are not good for us. But the reality is, is that we cannot defile the spiritual aspect of who we are by what we would put inside our bodies. But if you listen to somebody's conversation, if you listen to the words that they use, it doesn't take very long to, 
get a picture of what their heart looks like. David said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David knew that it was important that we search our hearts to see what's there. And guys, let me tell you what. When you're under pressure, when somebody squeezes you, that's when stuff comes out. When things aren't going well, when things aren't going right, those are the things that are inside you that maybe you can keep under wraps most of the time, but not all of the time. And as they would come out, that's when you need to stop and you need to turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want that to be in there. I don't want that ever to be my response to this type of situation or to be able to be under pressure and have this come out of me in such a way that it would replace the joy that I have with something that is far less. There's some that have taken this idea that somehow or another that nothing can defile us to a, to a wrong place. Within Christian circles in the modern church, there's a attraction that is gaining that says that it doesn't matter what you do with your body or it doesn't matter what you do with, with your mouth or it doesn't matter what you do because it's all just a matter of the heart. And unfortunately, we've got some Christian pastors that will use regularly profanity from a pulpit. We've got men's group that are, that are doing craft brewing as part of their fellowship time and sampling their, their different brews because it doesn't matter. You see, we're right with God in our heart. What happens in our body doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what kind of language I use. Guys, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is not taking and, and revoking the idea that we don't need to live in a righteous and holy state because we are to be holy because God is holy. And so there's not a... Not a matter of Jesus saying, oh, it doesn't matter what you do. There was a group that liked to promote that. They were called the Gnostics. Nothing that happens in the flesh matters. It's all about the Spirit. So go live like hell and expect to go to heaven. See how that works. It doesn't. And it's not going to. Again, our holiness is based on the fact that we serve a righteous and a holy God. So guys, I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you to form good and right traditions. Something that is meaningful, something that has value to it, that doesn't transcend or be in opposition to the Word of God, but enforces the Word of God in your lives and the lives of those around you. I want to encourage you to present that to the world in a positive way. Let your face know that there's joy in your heart. And as that which is in your heart, clean, transform, and made into the image of Jesus Christ starts to come forth, you're going to be a completely different person. Yeah, that's good, Mike. Practice that one, man. I like that. There's a smile. Let's pray. Heavenly.